people who are working in the field of liver disease know that Wilson's disease is now one of the commonest chronic liver disease that most of us see in day-to-day -day practice in a child, especially more than five years. So it is an important part and parcel of any hepatobiliary OPD, and it's something that we need to know about it because quite of us are going to see a lot of them. It is the commonest chronic liver disease, we know that. We also know, and we have been knowing it for a long time, almost close to 100 years, that it is because of deposition of copper in the various tissues that causes the disease. It has long been felt that its frequency is around 1 in 30 to 1 in 50,000, but recent data actually suggests now it's more close to 1 in 18,000 across the world, rather than the previous high figures of 1 in 30,000. And 1 in 90 is the gene frequency. That means 1 out of 100 people are carriers of the Wilson's disease gene. So you can imagine how common this would be and the number of cases that would be seen in a country like ours. The commonest presentation, which is the hepatobiliary presentation, is usually in the younger age group, starting from around 5 to 10, 15 years. But you would also get presentation in older, as old as 65 or even 70 years. Why do you get Wilson's disease? All of us eat food. All food contains copper. Copper is normally absorbed, goes into the portal circulation, goes into the liver. The liver makes use of the copper for various enzymes. The excess enzyme or the excess copper that is there in the liver, which is not necessary, is excreted into the bile, back into the intestine, and is excreted in the feces. Some part of the copper from the liver is incorporated in ceruloplasmin, which takes it to other tissues, where again copper is made use of. When you have a defect in the ATP7B gene, which is the gene which causes Wilson's disease, two major problems occur. One is there is defective excretion of copper from the liver into the biliary system, and there is also defective incorporation of copper into ceruloplasmin, Obviously, you can understand both of these things will lead to increased copper storage in the liver because all the excretory pathways out of the liver are affected. And that is really how you get Wilson's disease. We normally talk about Wilson's disease either affecting the liver or affecting the brain, but we also need to remember that there are other presentations. It can affect the kidneys, it can affect the heart. You can see the copper deposition in the eyes, though your vision is not affected. We have seen children, and especially something that is very common to India, is the bone involvement, and also hemolysis. So basically, it's a multi-systemic disorder. Not necessarily all the systems are affected. It could be one or more than one. Coming to the hepatic presentations. Now, really, any hepatic presentation can be a presentation of Wilson's disease. An acute hepatitis that is not settling could be Wilson's. An acute liver failure could be Wilson's. A chronic liver disease presentation with decompensation, portal hypertension, could be Wilson's. A child who has come to you just because of an asymptomatic hepatic megaly, could be Wilson's. A child who's being investigated for something else and you find transaminitis, child is absolutely asymptomatic, it could be Wilson's. So such a wide presentation that you require a very high index of suspicion. The most problematic nowadays is the acute and chronic presentation that the child has had Wilson's, not diagnosed because there are no complaints, gets superadded hepatitis A or some other minor infection like dengue or typhoid, and then the child presents with problems of the acute disease as well as the chronic disease. And this is the problem where usually the investigations and the management and the diagnosis is sometimes a little difficult. In neurological presentation, it's dysarthria, which is the commonest presentation in neurological Wilson's disease problem with speech, and unfortunately, it is also the one that responds the last and the least to medical treatment. Drooling of saliva, scholastic backwardness, in later stages, dystonia and tremors, don't come very early, gait disturbances. These are the common neurological features which you can see, and most of them, as you can see on the small slide over here, the neurological presentations, especially in the Western data, usually start after 10 to 15 years. But in India, we have even seen at 7 and 8 years onwards a neurological presentation. A lot of neurological presentation is associated with behavioral psychiatric. 
And these are usually between the ages of 10 to 15 years old. <laughs> and again here, you have the personality changes, mood sweep behaviors. Because this usually occurs in teenage children, quite a lot when it is ignored. It is thought to be a problem associated with adolescents or teenagers not behaving, stubborn behavior. And that is one of the reasons why neuropsychiatric presentations, behavioral presentations are quite often missed and a diagnosis of Wilson's disease is made much later while the symptoms have started much, much earlier. But the point to remember here is, unlike other neurological disorders, cognitive impairment is very minimal or not at all. Which are the other common manifestations? In our experience, the hemolysis, either acute hemolysis, so multiple episodes of acute hemolysis, and you will have children who have actually gone to the hematologists, worked up, and then sent to a pediatric hepatologist to look for Wilson's because it has not shown to be any hemolytic disorder. Or a chronic low-grade hemolysis. Both these presentations are common, may be associated with the liver disease, or may be presenting by itself without any evidence of liver disease at the onset. Renal problems, children coming to you with genuvarum, genuvalgum, knockneys, investigating further, found to have Fanconi syndrome, maybe nephrocalcinosis, renal tubular acidosis, is also quite common in Wilson's disease. And in fact, occult renal tubular involvement is much more common even in a patient in whom you have no evidence to suggest that there could be a renal involvement. And now, in fact, we are suggesting that every patient of Wilson's disease, whether hepatic or neurological, you must look for an underlying renal tuberal involvement. Cardiomyopathy, hypoparathyroidism, pancreatitis, these are uncommon. Most of them are because of copper deposition in these various organs. They may be present, but we don't see them as commonly as the presentations I've talked to you about. The biochemical diagnosis basically is a group. There is no one single diagnostic test besides the genetic test that you can do to make a diagnosis. The ceruloplasmin is the most commonly used test and the lower the ceruloplasmin, the more likely your patient with clinical problems has Wilson's. For example, if your ceruloplasmin in the child with chronic liver disease is 4, 5, 3, 2, you're almost certain that this is going to be Wilson's disease. But be careful of ceruloplasmins between 10 to 20, especially 15 to 20. They can occur normally, they can occur in carriers, and they can be quite confusing. Urinary copper, usually the cutoff has been told to be 100. Recent data suggests that if you're measuring the urinary copper by a very accurate method, either by an ASS or ICPMS, then even a cutoff of 40 can be taken, and anything more than 40 should be suggested to have Wilson's disease. Liver copper, if done in a good center, in our experience, we have tried most of the centers in the country for hepatic copper, and we have found them to be unreliable, to say the least. So really, you have to do all these tests, and when you suspect Wilson's disease, you ask for ceruloplasmin, you ask for urinary copper, you ask for getting a hepatic copper if you do a biopsy, you ask for a KF ring, and in the present situation, you may ask in confusing situations where the diagnosis is not clear, you may ask for a genetic diagnosis. And a genetic diagnosis in Wilson's disease is not to ask for any specific mutations like you could do in maybe some of the other metabolic liver diseases. You will need to look at the ATP7B mutation. But please remember, a presence of a mutation on both alleles, that is a biallelic mutation, either compound heterozygous or homozygous will give you a diagnosis of Wilson's disease. But the absence of a mutation, or only pick up one mutation on one allele, may not or will not rule out Wilson's disease. In the best of centers in the world, where a complete gene sequencing is done, along with the MLPA, the whole exome, even in those centers, only between 80 to 90% of Wilson's disease can pick up by mutation and analysis. So a negative mutational analysis by genetics does not rule out a Wilson's disease, especially if your clinical diagnosis is very high. Since there is no one particular test to make a diagnosis, there are various scores. There is the Leipzig score, there is the modified Leipzig score, which was taken out, which is relevant, I think, primarily for India. 
which basically gives a scoring to various things like presence or absence of KF ring, the level of ceruloplasmin, the urinary copper, any other features, clinical features, etc. And if you have a score of four or more, then you have a reasonable diagnosis. Anything less than that, you will require some other additional point to make you think of the possibility that this is Wilson's disease. If you look at the management diagnosis, there are various guidelines. There are guidelines from the ESL, the European Association of Study of Liver. There is a guideline from ESBGAN. Then three years back, there's a guideline which came from the Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology with the movement disorders, with the adult liver group. And the very most recent is the ASLD guidelines, which came up in 2022. So there are multiple guidelines, and majority of the guidelines are very similar. There are small differences here and there. So I'm not going to talk about one particular guideline. I'm going to talk about the things that are most relevant to us and what we do in our practice regularly. So coming to the management, the low of copper is very adjunctive. You cannot treat Wilson's disease by a low copper diet. However, you can help your medical treatment. As time is going on, the role of diet is coming lesser and lesser in the management of Wilson's disease. And really, as we know of it today, the role of the diet is in the first year or two of therapy, strict diet in the first year or two of therapy, especially in a child who's come to you in a decompensated stage or who you're not sure whether the treatment is going to help. An additional very strict diet of copper, low copper diet would be useful. After the first year or two, a little relaxation is allowed because by then the person is decoppered, oncillators hopefully, and the person is doing well. We are also not very strict with the diet that we used to give before. We just tell people to avoid things that are containing high copper, which include shellfish, from our point of view, mushroom, chocolates, nuts, because these are the things that really children like, especially the chocolates, and that's something that really high copper. So those are the things you should really avoid. But we don't want to do a very stringent dietary restriction because what will tend to happen with that is the child will not eat the food that you will give and the child will go into nutritional compromise. So really the management of that is medications and the medications are based chelators, penicillamine and triantine, and then zinc. What is the principle of therapy? Excess copper in the body, so obviously you want to reduce the copper to a subtoxic threshold. Chelators is the way to do that. Normally, depending on the dose you use, which chelator you use, and depending on what stage the child has come to you, it will take you between six months to 18 months to achieve this negative copper balance. And the drug for that, as I mentioned, are the chelators, which will do it rapidly. After you have reduced the copper to a subtoxic threshold, you need to keep it maintained there because if you stop your therapy, your copper is going to keep going up again because as I've said, our food contains copper. So you are taking copper every day and it's again going to start accumulating. So after you reduce your copper to subtoxic threshold, you have to maintain this child on drugs so that copper doesn't reaccumulate. and this treatment is lifelong. That is the first thing that you have to talk to the parents the treatment of Wilson's disease in some form or the other is lifelong. And unless you talk to them right in the beginning, it's going to be a problem to them when you talk to them later on. For this maintenance therapy, which is the second part, you can use the chelators in slightly lower doses, or here, zinc is also useful. Just briefly, for want of time, penicillamine is the chelator which we have got a maximum evidence in the Indian context is easily available. I give an approximate cost for a 30 kilogram child as a monthly cost, but it has a lot of side effects. But as I've said, the cost, availability, and the experience with penicillamine, at least for us, makes it as the drug of choice for most Wilson's disease. Triantine is also a chelator for a long time was not available in India. For the last two to three years, it's now available. There are two companies making triantine. It is definitely much more expensive than penicillamine. And the range of eight to 12,000 is the range of the two preparations that are available in the Indian market. Basic advantage is it has got very minimal side effects, really very minimal side effects. Where do we use it? We generally don't use it upfront. We will use it, penicillamine, as far as possible, but 
because of the side effects of penicillamine, you could have a child who may not be tolerating, and that occurs in around one in four, in which case you have to stop penicillamine and will go on to tarantine because you require chelators in the early phase. If there is very severe thrombocytopenia to start with, and when I say very severe thrombocytopenia, 20, 30,000 and low because of the liver disease or hyperspinism both together, platelet count of 50, 70,000, I'm not too worried, as long as I can monitor them very carefully. And if the patient has got very significant renal disease to start with, or over a period of time develops it, then I would be careful about using penicillin and L-GO to try and take. Zinc is not a chelator. It induces metallothionine in the enterocytes. So what tends to happen is whatever food you are eating, the copper in the food gets bound to this metallothionin. It remains in the enterocyte. It's not absorbed into the portal circulation. And as the cells are shed off every week, the cells along with the copper gets shed off. So copper gets excreted by the feces. It doesn't come out to the urine like the chelators do. Again, very minimal side effects and extremely cheap. Where can you use zinc? You can either use zinc as a co-therapy, that is you start penicillamine and zinc together, and we'll see when we can do that. You can use it especially in asymptomatic cases. You have an index case, you have screened the siblings and you picked up Wilson's disease, the child is fine. You don't want to use a drug like penicillamine which can cause side effects, zinc works well in that. And a patient on penicillamine who has been there for two, three years, has now been well coppered, doing well, you can think of putting this zinc as a maintenance therapy. We do not recommend zinc as a primary standalone therapy for liver disease. It has to be one of the chelators. So which are the common situations by which patients with liver disease will come to you? First is they can come to you with acute liver failure with encephalopathy. These are really the patients who require an urgent liver transplant. They are unlikely to make it without a liver transplant. So you list them for liver transplant, you start chelator and zinc because they are the severe active decompensated liver disease, but really you are going to require a liver transplant and you can all methods like a bridge for liver transplant, like you can use a plasma exchange, either high volume, low volume, Mars, or whatever other thing is there, but really majority of these children with encephalopathy will require a transplant. The second group is a group which is in liver failure, described as coagulopathy, but there is no encephalopathy. So remember, in children, acute liver failure need not have encephalopathy. Just coagulopathy is enough to label it as acute liver failure. So in these children, what you would normally do is, you would calculate a new Wilson's index, which is an index which basically gives you a scoring based on your bilirubin, INR, AST, WBC. And if the child has a score of more than or equal to 11, this child is most likely going to require a liver transplant and you have to start listing this particular child. However, remember that Wilson's disease is a treatable disease and there have been n number of children who have been, have a new Wilson's index of more than or equal to 11, listed for transplant, started on chelators and zinc, given supportive therapy in the form of plasma exchange and over a period of time have gone off the transplant list because your basic treatment along with your plasma exchange or whatever else you're doing has treated this child and the child has not required a liver transplant. That is not the rule, that is an exception, but there are more children. So be careful about transplanting Wilson's disease children as compared to other liver disease children where if they're going downhill, they are going rapidly downhill because there is no medical treatment. Those with intermediate severity are the standard ones which come to you with chronic liver disease, little bit of decomposition here and there. There, you could put them on chelators. Some groups put chelators along with zinc. There is no head-to-head -head study shows that one is better than the other. So really, it's up to you what you would like to do. We used to give chelators and zinc before, from my personal perspective, but we have to remember that chelators and zinc have to be given four or five hours apart. And both chelators and zinc have to be given on an empty stomach. Penicillamine and triantine or zinc cannot be given with food. It has to be given two hours after a food, and food has to be one taken one hour later on. So be careful, because when you're giving chelators and zinc together, you are going to have a problem of giving it appropriately, and the patient is not going to comply. Coming to asymptomatic transamonitis, so you screened a child, you found a child has got deranged trans uh, LFTs, 
You could either use a low dose chelators or zinc. Choice is yours. Some people prefer chelators. Most people prefer chelators, some say zinc, because these patients have transhumanitis or active disease. But you could also pick up asymptomatic children with normal transhumanitis. In this situation, as well as the smaller baby who may be picked up by genetic, zinc is the way to go, though some people still may use penicillamine. But remember, clinically the child may improve, biochemically the child may improve, but this paper by Anil Dhawan a long time back has showed that it can take a very long time for your transhumanizes and your coagulopathy to improve, as long as a few years. As long as your biochemical trend is towards improvement, your clinical trend is towards improvement, you don't require normalization of all your values to decide that this child is doing well or not. The worsening must stop first. I'm not going to talk too much about transplant because we know it's for acute liver failure, but just a slide on what is the role of liver transplant for neurological Wilson, because this is the hottest topic going on in the world today. If a person has got neurological Wilson's disease with hardly any liver involvement, will a liver transplant help? There have been case reports in the past 15 years primarily from the French groups, who have shown a significant improvement of neurological symptoms when they have not responded to the neurological symptoms with deep penicillamine therapy, but after a liver transplant, they have shown improvement. Patients where liver transplants have been done for liver disease, but the patient also has neurological problems, people have shown that, of course, the liver disease has got better, but even the neurological problems in these patients have got better. So there is a big to and fro whether it should be done for neurological. None of the guidelines available today suggest it, but it seems that we are heading in that direction. A very recent systematic review which talked about it, which came out just last year, which basically based its data on case reports and studies showed that 71% of patients who underwent a liver transplant had improvement in the neurological. They did not have the transplant only for neurological. Some did. Some had it for liver, but also had neurological symptoms. And some of the neurological involvement was severe neurological involvement. So even that got better. Initially, there was a worry. There were some papers which came out that survival was very poor in patients who underwent liver transplant with, and if they had neurological problems. But recent studies don't seem to suggest that is necessarily true. What is still unclear, really, is we don't really know which one is out of the 100 is going to respond, which are the 70%. So that still requires a little bit more of data to come out. So my last slide basically is from the Indian perspective. I used to give talks. I've been giving talks on Wilson's disease for the last many years. And initially, I used to keep talking to people, think of Wilson's, suspect Wilson's, you're missing Wilson's. That is still true. But now I'm worried about the other factor. A lot of patients are getting overdiagnosed as Wilson's. And that is the biggest problem coming to us Ceruloplasmine 15-16 labeled by a pediatrician as Wilson's disease started treatment and then coming to us. So now we have both ends of the spectrum, underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis. We have a varied presentation. We have to look at the cost and availability of medicines, but at least all the medicines available abroad are now available in India, which itself is a very big thing, though they're expensive. I've talked to you a little bit about liver transplants and the controversy behind the neurological. There is no controversy about acute liver failure. Molecular genetics is, again, something that's coming up in a big way. So you have to understand molecular genetics of Wilson's disease is not so straightforward. A positive diagnosis is important. A negative genetic mutation diagnosis may not rule out Wilson's disease. And we have to really now concentrate on the rehabilitation of all these children, either for neurological or for hepatic Wilson's disease. I thank you all for a patient listening.